So welcome back to another edition of the Question Guy podcast. Of course, my name is Dr. Keith McNeil, and I'm here with Dr. Joe. Dr. Joe Hello. Perez. Dr. How are you Keith. Doing? <laughs> How are doing you doing great. this morning? I'm all right, sir. How are you today? I'm doing pretty good. And so I appreciate you joining me in conversation. And that's always what this podcast is all about. And it's really to talk about what's really important with my guest. But I we've got some backstory. And so we initially, you know, connected on LinkedIn almost, gosh, mm-hmm. probably about a year ago or so. It feels like forever. <laughs> um, and in that time, when we first talked, uh, you were going, you wanted to go in a specific direction in your life. And I, I wasn't quite sure where my next agenda is in terms of my career was going. Um, so I want to talk to you about that. But before we get into that, if anybody isn't aware of who you are, I want to make sure that they know who you are. And you are Dr. <laughs> Joe. So tell me, what is Dr. Joe all about? Oh, first of all, Keith, I want to thank you so much for inviting me to be on your program. It's such an honor and privilege. And uh, I've been following you for a while. You're doing some great things yourself. Um, so I um, uh, I was an educator for 10 years. Uh, my background in education, I have both a, a bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees, all in education. Uh, in my graduate career, I had a double minor in computers and theology. Mm. Uh, it was... Um, to get into the teaching profession. Um, Technology has always been like a secondary love for me, uh, but a primary love has always been to share information with people, right? Uh, As an educator, of course, you do that all the time. So for me, the speaking thing is not new. Uh, Mm -hmm. I love making connections. I love seeing the lights come on in the, uh, the eyes of my students or my coworkers or my audience. Whoever it happens to be that's listening to me yammering and yakking, uh, if they've taken the time to listen to me, the least I could do is give it everything I got to make it a worthwhile experience for them, Mm -hmm. you know, to say, you're going to be better off, you're going to know something, you're going to learn something, you're going to achieve something when I'm done. Uh, And that's what I'm all about. You know, I want to make that connection. I want to make um, people better than what they were when they when they started off, uh, whether it be through my professional development teaching, my talking about integrity and leadership, uh, whether I'm talking about educational principles, whether I'm teaching Bible, whether I'm uh, teaching economics, uh, whether I'm talking about information technology. You wait, know, wait, and, wait, and hold, wait, 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 wait. You just listed big, four or big, five yeah, different I know. things. Yeah. <laughs> Oh big, my gosh! Big How range, can... and yeah. So, are you by nature? You are a college professor. You you taught at no, college. No, I, I taught in high schools. Okay, you taught in high school. Okay, and you taught right. all I that. I worked in. A, I worked in a college. Yeah, for okay. uh, for twenty five years. Uh, I was I was at NC State University, and um, uh, as okay. a. Uh, yeah, go pack. That's right. No, no shameless plug there. Yeah. All wait, right. said, wait, yeah. wait, wait, wait. I graduated ECU. So oh, like, way back in the day. Go Pirates. <laughs> all right. Yeah. There you go. I like them Pirates. Yeah. I so, think that's, is that the thing you guys do, right? Arr, oh, God. Like that, that was back in the 90s, man. I'm not yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, we do this for Wolfpack and we do this for the Pirates. You know, that's supposed to be like the hook, oh, you right. know, the Pirate. Yeah, yeah right. I am so pretty. Well, it's Scully. Yeah. Well, back in the day, it was Scully was our mascot. So it was the, the um, pirate skull, kind of like the skull and bones skull. Oh, okay. But, but Scully, that, that, right. That yeah. Was, yeah, that was that was the mascot. I was thinking of X Files, you know, Mulder and Scully. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so, yeah. but so you taught, you taught in high, you were a high school teacher, but you That's right. did, did you then go to technology? And work at a college? Yes. Okay. That's right. Okay. So, so the what last was that six years. Yeah, that's that's an excellent question, Dr. Keith. Um, So in my last six years as an educator, um, every summer I took on more and more and more responsible summer jobs uh, as a supplement to my income. Teachers don't get paid all that much. I wasn't in it for the money anyway. You still got to have it to live, you know, and to buy stuff and to get food and, you know, put a roof over your head and that kind of thing. Um, So. I, I was getting better and better. As a matter of fact, I got so good at it in my last year of teaching, um, I was running the computer lab at the school where I taught, which was pretty cool. Okay. Um, yeah. 
So leveraging that uh, that ability, um, there uh, an amazing opportunity came up uh, at the university where I was hired on as a computer consultant. Then I was promoted to analyst programmer, then uh, computer training manager, and I wound up, after, you know, in my whole 25-year tenure there, uh, the last uh, position I held um, was business intelligence specialist. Hmm. And it was always my passion to leverage that communication skill, leverage that uh, passion for actionable data, leverage that desire for people to be able to gain insight uh, from the information that's pre that's presented mm -hmm. that allowed me to uh, to really thrive in that environment at NC State in um, in teaching professors and, and others uh, how to use the reporting systems that were put together, also to lead a team that would ensure that the reports that uh, were created on the data that was uh, that was being presented would be presented in such a way as to ensure these decision makers can derive the insight they need from it. Um, doing so so that, you know, hey, anybody can make a pretty bar graph or a nice, good looking chart, but is it right? You know, does it mislead people or does it present it in the right way? It's mm -hmm. important that it be visually compelling, but more important that it be right and that you weave all these different parts of your business intelligence reporting strategy uh, into a story that people can relate to uh, and into decisions that can be derived from it. And so, is that what kind of launched you into the keynote? There you comment? go. Because, right. because again, when we first talked, that was kind of your, your next strategy. And mm -hmm. that was your foundation. And to my understanding, at least based on what I see on, on LinkedIn, on YouTube, you've then now been in the past, what, 12 months, been all over the world. Um, yes. at, at least most of it anyway. Yeah, not all. Yeah, the uh, you know, in the in the first couple of years, the, the speaking part. That's speaking is not new. You know, I, right, I spoke right. at conferences uh, over. Well, you know, the twenty five years that I was at the the university, the the conferences and the workshops and the events, and so forth, were self contained within the university. The thing that was new, uh, the new phenomenon, starting in uh, I'd say about twenty eighteen was speaking at conferences and events that were away from the place where I worked, that were sponsored by, you know, uh, put on by outside organizations. And it started off really small, maybe a handful the first couple of years. Then comes the pandemic, and then comes, you know, a, a, lot, of, um, uh, a lot of word of mouth. You know, it really, there wasn't any advertising on my part. I just kept getting invited, and people would hear about it. Uh, they would ask, hey, can you propose this? What do you think? Is this a good topic? Um, can, can you talk about X, Y, Z? I would do that and people would find out and would invite me to others. So that mushroomed uh, to 20 or 30 something in, in, in 2020, uh, 40 something in 2021, uh, and now over more than 30 of them now in 2022. So it has just exploded like crazy. And I've the, the venues, most of them, of course, you know, during the pandemic were virtual, uh, but I didn't look at it as a negative thing rather than refusing. I, I had <laughs> I had to turn down almost as many as I was being invited to because it was just amazing. Uh, it kind of got my name out there. I mean, I'm a virtual unknown. You know, it's not like I'm a Keith McNally or anything, you know. Well, I'm not. Uh, and that's that who they either. thought I would make. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You're not that either, right? You know. Well, who do they think I am? You know, Colin Powell or, or whatever, whatever famous name. Uh, you know, Simon Sinek, right, or whatever. Uh, it was just an ordinary guy with a perhaps an extraordinary way of conveying extraordinary topics or topics that I'm extraordinarily passionate about. Right. And right. I think that was part of the key is to make it relevant and resonant with the folks. Uh, to um, to do it in a in an exciting manner, in a way that engages and involves the audience, in a way that reminds them, hey, you know, you're not just sitting there like a bunch of stuffed shirts. I'm going to involve you in this thing, and I'm going to try to make it exciting for you. You know, to hold attention of a of a classroom full of high school students is 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 challenging enough. Mm -hmm. So, you know, do apply those same principles and engage your audience. Don't just read your slides. Don't just stand there like a bump on the log. 
Show some passion. If you're excited about your topic, you want to ignite that same excitement within the people that are in your audience. Uh, and, and that was really the newness of the phenomenon in the, in the late uh, in the late 20 teens, so to speak. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, that kind of put my name in front of a lot of people. It catapulted me into the into the scene of speakers. And then when the pandemic, uh, the you know, conditions warranted the ability to be able to start in-person meetings again. The pent-up demand for, you know, we are an agrarious people. I mean, virtual is okay, I suppose, and it's fine because mm-hmm. really there was no way that I could be in Sydney, Australia on Monday and London on Wednesday and Houston on Thursday, right? The conferences were, you know, sponsored by cities there, but I, it was all virtual. There's no way I could do that in person. So, yes. The virtual had its place of getting my name out there and getting me exposure and giving me the opportunity to create value uh, and to help a bunches of people, some crowds as big as 1,500 to 2,000 at one time, um, you know, it it was was an amazing thing. So now that, you know, there's been a switch to in-person, all that pent-up demand that's been building for the last couple of years, right? you know, has just literally exploded. And I, in three months, uh, three months I've been to, well, in four months, I've been to a continent other than the one where I reside. Let me put it that way. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 you know, it's just been amazing. And so I took a different direction. I went and had these individual conversations with people uh, virtually, uh, have not yet left right. my house. <laughs> in many, many years here in Virginia, um, but having these virtual conversations with people and they all have fantastic stories, you know, similar to, well, not similar to you, but everybody has their uniqueness and their mm-hmm. value and that they're bringing out to the world. I think um, one of the things that the pandemic really facilitated was people wanting to, to maintain that connection. And we found right. a way, you know, and, exactly. and we found a way. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, whether it's an in-person connection or a virtual connection, the point is make the connection, mm-hmm. right? We we are again. I say we are an agrarian species. You know, I mean that's uh, we 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 long to. You know, th- who was it that said no man is an island, right? And, and there's got to be some sort of interaction with other creatures like unto us, <laughs> and uh, otherwise we go stir crazy. Yeah, and. And, and and that's just it. The the nice thing about even now, even the you know, with the majority, hopefully of uh, knock on wood, uh, the uh, the effects of the pandemic being behind us, mm-hmm. still the virtual is there because it, it showed. Okay, they say necessity is the is the mother of invention, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and innovation is is the father of forward thinking okay so uh, because of that it kind of forced us into the situation where we had to adapt it's uh, adapt or die right it's you know it's innovate or stagnate it's move forward or fall on your face you know so you utilize and you uh you leverage the technology that's available uh, taking full advantage of it and uh, capitalize on the opportunity so that you can where else and how else could you be talking to somebody in Australia or Japan or Germany or or London, you know, whatever, uh, if it weren't for this wonderful uh, technical medium that we have. And I guess the the situation during the pandemic got us all to thinking, okay, uh, let's make the best of the situation and let's use what we have to try somehow to maintain that contact. Right. But now that we've yeah. And so now that we've gotten into the in person, we can use both uh, some of the hybrid events, uh, one that um, uh, that I'll be giving a keynote in in Orlando in two weeks, for example, there'll be a hybrid uh, portion to that. Uh, another You'll be one on that stage. Mm, yes, sir. OK. OK, cool. Mm, cool. Right. Cool. I'll, I'll be on stage. Uh, yeah. And in the last three, uh, the when I was on st- the keynote that I had last month in Nuremberg, Germany. That was an amazing experience. They had, you know, it was live streamed. Uh, you know, they had three, it was pretty cool. It was like a TV production. Those guys are slick uh, at uh, Ebner Love Media. It. They they put on an amazing conference at Developer Week uh, in, in Nuremberg. I mean, they had three cameras on me live streaming and it was just, uh, I, I I had a blast, you know, walking all over the stage, throwing candy, 
you know, to, uh, for, yeah. And that's the thing. You can't do that in a virtual, you know, you <laughs> can engage. Work. Yeah. It, it won't work. It'll bounce off the whack. It'll, you know, it'll hit the, yeah. Right. <laughs> so you can't do that. Um, but, but let me, so but again, let's flip the coin real quick. So when you go sure. and talk to people, um, you, you can't just throw, like you said earlier, it's not just about reading from slide deck. We're talking about data. It has to be presented mm. in a way where it's really impactful and people really absorb yes, it. And so that involves story. So, yes. so how does story get wrapped into data science or anything else that you talk about? Cause that would be really, I mm. think that would be challenging, you know, that would just to make it real to somebody because I'm not a data scientist, but I wouldn't know. But I know that, you know, everybody has a story to tell. And some people just tell it better than others, even if it's their right. own story. So how do you apply story to when you're when you're communicating with others? I'd be really Excellent. interested. Sure. Excellent question, Keith. So um, when when I'm speaking, all right, um, there's there's a beginning and an ending, right? Mm -hmm. There's um, uh, I guess if you think about a story, you think about a story that has a plot in it, a story that has um, a protagonist and an antagonist. Mm -hmm. uh, there is conflict and then there's resolution to that conflict. Mm -hmm. So if you at while you're presenting uh, maybe an, a stunning introduction that uh, that starts off with an interesting story, uh, which is what I try to do uh, to have some kind of an interesting some fact from history. Um, one of my presentations, I talk about the moon launch. That was very, um, the, the neat thing. One of the times that I presented and, and used this illustration was like a week from the, like the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. Okay. And it was, it was perfect timing to, uh, to, to talk about how the innovative spirit that, uh, that was utilized to get there is the same innovative spirit that we need to have when dealing with change or when uh, trying to ensure that the story we tell with our data is done in, in a way that can move forward and, and you know, make a difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's relating things that are going on in a person, maybe relating things that are going on in a person's life. Uh, talking about, you know, if they've been in a frustrating situation, what happened? How did they come out of that situation? Okay. Um, and how uh, finding out what's going on in your business, um, finding out if there's a reason for certain trends um, and relating it to what happens if we make this particular decision. Um, Jane Doe's going to lose her job and, you know, she's not going to be able to feed her kids. You know, um, uh, if we go this other direction, then we can hire uh, 300 more people in this division. You know, always relate it to something that has to do with a person, something that has to do with what's going on in the world or what's going on in their lives. Um, and, um, you know, making it into something that uh, that people can relate to. So I don't want to put you on the spot, but I do. Can you give me yeah. an example other than the moon landing? <laughs> because I think all right. those things are valuable. I think, you know, if sure. you could kind of, um, so especially the idea of, you know, somebody losing their job, you know, that that's really would grab anybody's attention. And how can we avoid something like that? So do you have like a typical mm -hmm. go-to story that, or is it really, um, do you really study? Well, this, well, I'm asking too many questions and that's right. <laughs> part of my, and that's my brand. I'm the question guy. So, but I ask too many yeah, questions are. sometimes. Yeah, that's all right. Um, what's your favorite story to tell? I, I guess is the best way to approach uh, the, sure. the question. So uh, another one of my, uh, yeah, oh, I have several, you know, it didn't. <laughs> okay. Whenever you ask a technical minded person a question, a question that you would normally expect to be answered with a yes or a no, you know you're not going to get a yes or no. You're going to get it depends. Oh God! It really does. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, it, it really does depend. Um, I have several. Okay, uh, so uh, one that I've used when um, uh, in, in a presentation that I have called "Driving uh, Driving Decisions with Data: Delight or Disaster." Okay, what's the importance of listening to and watching good data and knowing how to ignore bad data? 
Okay, a, a couple of examples that I've used before was the um, uh, the story about the radio operator uh, in uh, the summer of, or excuse me, in the fall of 1941, who intercepted a message uh, from the Japanese high command, and it sounded like uh, it was just an ordinary thing. And it was one word in particular, and I haven't used this story in a while, so since you're putting me on the spot, I can't remember what it is, but I want to say the word was something like mokusatsu, and he translated mokukatsu or something. He he transposed two of the letters, uh, and, and one of them had a negative connotation, the other one had a positive connotation. He chose to take the one that had the positive connotation, and uh, had he thought about it twice and taken the other connotation, it could potentially have made a difference in the rapid response or the slow response uh, to the U.S. leading up uh, to the attack on Pearl Harbor. Okay. Now, you know, there's positive and negative to that. Of course, you know, you save the lives of 2,000 soldiers and you delay the U.S. getting into the war and it might have come out, you know, not that I'm saying that Pearl Harbor should have happened. I don't mean it like that, but, right, you right. know, when, it's, when, it's you, when you think about data, yeah. Right. Interpretation yeah. of data that a very minor thing like the transposition of two letters, uh, you know, you think of the possibilities of how differently things would have turned out, regardless of how you might feel about the positive or negative about, you know, the thing that you're you're referring to. That's right. one. Um, another one is uh, Stanislav Petrov. Uh, he was a lieutenant colonel in the Russian Air Defense Force. He um, he got a blip on his radar that he was looking at. Uh, he was part of uh, the Soviet early warning satellite system uh, in Serpukov uh, near Moscow. And um, he, he was looking at his scope and it's like, oh, good grief. It looks like the United States has launched a nuclear missile. Uh, and there's five more coming at us. Oh my God! So he could have sounded the alarm. He could have gone according to Soviet policy at the time, you know, because this was when the Soviet, you, you know, uh, this was like 1983. Um, Cold War era, okay. Or Cold War era, right near the end of the Cold yeah. War era, and uh, and it was just three weeks after the Soviets had accidentally shot down uh, the uh, uh, Korean Airlines 007. And so he's scratching his head, looking at this thing. It's like, okay, I press the button and and warn everybody, and uh, we'll have a counterattack, counterstrike back, and it would have resulted in thermonuclear war. Well, come to find out, there was a um, uh, there was a malfunction. He <laughs> thought that there was a malfunction. He decided to go against policy and not sound the alarm. I mean, he did sound an alarm to say, hey. Uh, I think there's something wrong with this, you know, <laughs> instead of, oh, let's go fight the bad Americans, you know. Right. Uh, and so he is credited with having prevented the start of World War Three, potentially. Cool. Yeah. So, you know, well, good. Uh, and, the, and the idea is, all right, how important is it to go with your gut when you're talking about data? Right. Uh, uh, and you're talking about de making decisions based on data. Either you listen to good data when you know that it's sound or you ignore data and you say, eh, I think my instincts are telling me this just doesn't look right. It doesn't pass the smell test. I hmm. better check it out and dig deeper before I go and jump to false conclusions. And that's the whole idea about the data, deci the, the decision making process when it goes to having it driven by data. Right. What about Stanislav Petrov? You know, had he listened just to the data, then there would be craters now where buildings, you know, now stand. Right. I think that but would be a great conversation to have in yeah. more depth. Um, just to really appreciate that. But maybe today is not the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but those are, but I don't mean that they're not great. They're great stories, but they're because what you said really impacted me. He says, do we listen to our gut? Um, mm -hmm. And you've got data sitting in front of you that's telling you something it's literally telling it's communicating something to you but then we're human right we right. have certain instincts and instinctual responses to things um and so marrying those two ideas are really important when we make Absolutely. decisions when we make decisions and i think that's really valuable yes. but there's one more thing i wanted to talk to you about before our time is up and you are running okay. a podcast yes but it's my mind to mind it would it, it is. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm a co-host. It's uh, 
Uh, Tiffany Nielsen is the uh, is is my oh, co-host. Well, I'm, next time the two of you. Or I'm her co-host. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So, what is mine uh, tomorrow? So, yeah. Mine is a monthly podcast. We'll call it a talk show more than a podcast. I suppose you can call it a they're different strokes for different. I guess, but uh, uh, the two of us we don't ever uh, we don't have any guests. At least we haven't had any guests as of yet. Uh, we pick a topic that is of interest, and the idea is her mind and my mind uh, giving our thoughts on on that particular topic of interest and how can we bring our different perspectives together to come up with something that's interesting to the audience. Uh, in Tiffany's case, from uh, from a marketing standpoint, from an IoT standpoint, in my case, from a an educator's standpoint perspective, from a uh, from a, a master data management type person or a, a systems analyst um, perspective, and we put our perspectives together and um, just go back and forth, have some pretty interesting banter, uh, and uh, and talking about these topics of interest. Are they are they live events or are they just recorded events? Once again, I answer like the tech guy answers. It depends. Okay. <laughs> most of the sorry, most of the time it's live. Okay. okay. Most of the time it is it is live. Um, however, with my speaking schedule, uh, for example, the next time we're supposed to go live, I'm supposed to be in Orlando, so uh, it's going to be recorded. Um, the uh, the July. I don't remember if it was June or July. Whichever one it was that uh, was when I was speaking in Scotland um we we had to, it was pre-recorded so okay. you know if i'm not somewhere else on this planet or in some other city speaking uh or something then uh uh then we we do it live i we she and i prefer to do it live mm -hmm. um because of course it, it it live streams out to uh, let's see we live stream it out to youtube linkedin live vimeo uh, I don't think we're on Facebook yet, uh, and one other outlet. It's the built-in outlet uh, at uh, the uh, the IoT marketing website. So, so we're about uh, four, live stream out to about four or five different sources simultaneously. Simulcast. There you go. Cool. That sounds. That's not. We are simulcast in five different outlets. <laughs> and that's perfect. And so, what's next for Dr. Joe? What, where, what's the next? What's 2023 going to look like? Or what does 2023 look like? Uh, looks a long <laughs> way away, but it'll be here before you know it. <laughs> four months, man. No, four uh, months. That's right. Just oh four months gosh. away. So, um, well, I'm, I'm hoping to continue, um, the trend, uh, maybe not 30 <laughs> engagements next year, uh, as I had this year, but, uh, uh, Holy Grail, it would, would be to, uh, start, uh, going live, not live, excuse me, in person to some of these countries that I've spoken at virtually. Okay. Uh, one of those bucket list items I'll already have in October, I've spoken virtually in Australia uh, five or six times. I've never been there in person, but next month I'll be speaking at NDC Sydney. So I get to fly to Australia. Looking forward to that. Oh, wow. Oh, love well, it, sure love that's it, love fantastic. It, love yeah. yeah, that sounds exciting. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now I'm jealous. So uh, other, you know, yeah <laughs> yeah the, well these other countries you know where i've where i've been virtually um that that'll be my goal for 2023 is to uh, uh is to go there and some... okay good well dr joe i appreciate your time today and thank you for Absolutely. having a conversation with me on the question guy podcast dude we gotta do it again sometime but when absolutely as soon as you have time thank you so much it's my honor and pleasure, Dr. Keith. I appreciate your time and uh, I appreciate what you're doing. Keep up the phenomenal work, sir. <laughs> so how was that?